Welcome back to part two of chapter five, Search and Seizure. I left off talking about Spaceship and we went through two. We went through the first S, Search Incidental to Lawful Arrest, and we went through Plain View or those inadvertent sightings. The A in Spaceship is going to refer to the automobile exception. So really the dilemma that a police officer has is when dealing with vehicles, he or she has to figure out, do they have probable cause against the operator of the vehicle, the vehicle, and or both? For purposes of this lecture, the automobile exception does not need to be overthought. It's real easy. When we're talking about the automobile exception, we have probable cause against the vehicle. Here's a couple of examples to sort of maybe figure this out. Police officer is on some sort of traffic post in a car, notices an operator go through a red, a red light, stop sign, doesn't matter, any sort of violation of the vehicle and traffic law. Police officer stops this operator. Right now, who does the police officer have probable cause against? The person, the vehicle, or both? Well, the vehicle didn't do anything wrong. The vehicle did not commit an offense. It was the operator behind the wheel of the vehicle that committed the offense. So right now, the police officer only or solely has probable cause against the operator of the vehicle. Now, let's say we're talking about a vehicle that was used in an armed robbery. So if we're talking about armed robbery, robbery, of course, a larceny with either the use or the immediate threat of force, and armed, we're talking about some type of deadly weapon and or dangerous instrument. More often than not, when we're talking about armed robberies, we're usually talking about robberies with a firearm. So that would be a deadly weapon. Right now, if a police officer would stop that vehicle, not only does the police officer, based on a detailed description, have probable cause against the operator of the vehicle, but also the fact that it was an armed robbery and there is a, a good likelihood that that deadly weapon is in the vehicle gives the police officer probable cause against the vehicle. So really, the automobile exception only ever talks about probable cause against the vehicle. Uh, when we're talking about searches conducted via the automobile exception, at least in New York State, what we're talking about is that a police officer can search that vehicle bumper to bumper. And also, if there is a locked trunk, the police officer can, with minimal damage, pop that lock and check the trunk. Same thing would go for a glove box or any sort of locked container with, within the vehicle itself. This is excluding briefcases and or knapsacks that are locked with no key readily available. The next part of Spaceship is going to be the C, and this is consent. Now, a lot of times when we talk about consent, what we're talking about, did a person say yes or did a person say no? But in terms of legality, really, we have to understand what is legal consent. Now, I told you, for those of you that were taking notes, to put the word VIC, that acronym VIC, V-I-K. V is going to stand for voluntary, that consent must be given voluntary, without coercion, meaning a police officer asks, may I search that bag? Or a police officer at gunpoint asks, may I search that bag? That second scenario could be considered or could be viewed by the courts as being coerced to give consent. Intelligently, persons under 16 years of age cannot legally give consent to, let's say, search a premises, uh, searches of their own backpacks, things like that. A school administrator or parent should be present to give that, that consent as well. Now, 
at least in New York State, there are some weird numbers when we're talking about juveniles or even how to even define what a juvenile is. So I just said that uh, a minor 16, uh, under the age of 16 cannot give consent. However, when we're talking about sexual consent, that number changes from 16 to 17. So let's say a male that is 20 years old has a 15 year old girlfriend. The two of them both decide to have sex. Both the man and the woman say, yes, I want to have sex. The 20 year old can legally consent to this sexual encounter. However, the 15 year old, even though she said yes, and she's, we're, we're going to figure that she's of sound mind, she's of reasonable intelligence, can make decisions like this on her own, even though she had said yes, legally, she cannot give consent. K, the knowingly, meaning that no trickery by law enforcement can be used. If you let me search that bag and I find the murder weapon, I promise I won't charge you with murder. That is a clear example of trickery. Law enforcement cannot do that, nor can they search someone that is intoxicated. Because if you are intoxicated by definition, by legal definition, you are not of sound mind. Some other issues when we're talking about consent is we're going to talk about residential consent, meaning when can police search a residence with quote unquote legal consent? Let's say we have two roommates that live in an apartment. They both have equal dominion over that um, apartment. They both pay the same amount in rent, regardless. Police knock on the door. Let's say both tenants are there. They open up the door. Police ask, may we search the premises? If both parties say, yes, we consent to this search, police can search the complete area. They can search the complete apartment, individual bedrooms and common areas, common areas like the living room, the kitchen. If there's only one bathroom in this apartment, that would be considered a common bathroom since both utilize it. Now, let's say both tenants are home. Police knock on the door. They open the door. Uh, police ask, may we search the residence? The person who answers the door say, why yes, officer, you may come in, I have nothing to hide. But that other tenant hears this and says, absolutely not, I do not want police in my residence. Police cannot search that residence. Let's change some factors around now. Let's say again, we have our two tenants living in an apartment one is at work, one is in the, the apartment. Police knock on the door. The one that's in the apartment requests, uh, opens up the door, the police request consent to search. That person says yes. Well, that person says yes, and since there's no one to say no, the police are allowed to search this residence. However, there are some provisions here. The police can search only the areas that the person who is inside can actually give consent to search. So common areas, common areas like a living room, a kitchen that they both utilize, a bathroom that they both utilize. But let's say we have two distinct bedrooms. Since we have two distinct bedrooms, the police are allowed to search the bedroom of the tenant who's inside the apartment. However, the tenant who's not in the apartment the tenant who is at work, well, since they are not there to consent to the search, the person who's there cannot give consent because that person who is at work exercises dominion over their own bedroom. Using this sort of logic, let's say I am an owner of a three-story house. I live on the first floor, 
the second floor is vacant, and the third floor I rent out to a tenant, regardless of whether I have an oral contract or a written contract, really doesn't matter as the way the law looks at this. So police come knocking on the door to the house that I own, and they request to search the whole house. Well, I say, police, I have nothing to hide. There is nothing that I'm worried about in my house. Feel free. Well, now where can the police search? Well, I reside on the first floor. So if I reside on the first floor, I can give consent for the police to search anywhere on that first floor. The second floor is vacant, meaning let's say I use it as a rental property, but there's no one there renting it right now. If there is no one there renting it right now, that is my property, and I can give police consent to search the second floor. So right now the police have searched the first floor, they have searched the second floor. Now let's talk about the third floor. I own this house. This is my house. I'm, I own it free and clear. I don't even pay a mortgage on it anymore. So it's not even like the bank owns it. I own it outright. However, I rent it to some other party. That party has what's called lessee rights because they lease the apartment from me. Again, regardless of whether it is oral or written, does not, ma- does not matter. If that tenant and I have entered into a contract, into a meeting of the minds, and we were both of sound mind at the time that we entered into this contract, I cannot give consent to search that third floor. The only person I can give consent to search that third floor is the person who is leasing the apartment, that tenant. Now it gets even a little bit more interesting when we're talking about husband and wife, domestic partners, anyone that's in sort of a civil union, anything to that effect. Here's where things get interesting. Well, they both cohabitate, they both reside, let's say, in a house. Either one can give consent to search. Now, here's where this idea of exercising dominion comes in. Let's say there's only one bedroom in the house and they both sleep in that bedroom. Let's say it's a husband and wife, just for example. Let's say the wife is at work, husband is home. Police knock on the door, husband opens up the door, police request consent to search the entire premises. The husband says, sure, officer, me and my wife have nothing to hide. So police come in. So now they search, again, those common areas. Common areas like the living room, kitchen. Let's say there's only one bathroom in this uh, house. They can search that. Well, now there's only one bedroom and they both cohabitate in that bedroom. Here's where there are some gray areas. Police ask, can we search the bedroom? The husband says, yes. But the police can only search common areas in that bedroom. So let's say there is a bed. They can search the bed. But when we're talking about, let's say, a chest of drawers, usually most people have their own chest of drawers. So if the husband has his own chest of drawers where only he keeps his clothing, he can give consent to search that. However, if the wife has her own chest of drawers where she keeps her clothing and she is not present to give consent to search, the police cannot search that chest of drawers without procuring a search warrant first. I'm not really going to talk about parent and children because we get into some real weird gray areas about emancipated children. Usually, parents can give consent to search a child's room. Schools can sometimes, with limited provisions, allow police to search lockers. But again, police have to demonstrate a reason why they're doing it. It can't just be arbitrary because I don't like the way that person looks. They look like they're up to something. Looking like you're up to something is not an articulable legal reason to conduct any sort of custodial search or any sort of custody incident. Lastly, when we're talking about hotels, Let's say I rent a hotel 
for a weekend. Atlantic City does not matter. Once I've rented that room, I've entered into a temporary sort of lessee agreement with the hotel, with the management staff, with the ownership of this hotel, that I've paid my money for, let's say, two days, a Saturday and a Sunday. So for Saturday and Sunday, I sort of exercise lessee rights over that hotel room. So here's where things might get a little interesting. One of the great things about hotels is that you get hospitality service, you get maid service. Now, let's say in my hotel room, I have a big bag of white powder that in law enforcement's training experience, they know to be cocaine. This is inside my room that I have paid for, that I have temporarily rented from this hotel. I was of sound mind, management was of sound mind. So let's sort of strike that stuff out. I leave my hotel room on or about nine o'clock in the morning. I go to get breakfast. Maybe I'm gonna go to a casino. Maybe I'm gonna go to a show, does not matter. I leave the cocaine in the room and I put on the door maid service. So what am I doing? Well, I'm giving consent for the maid to come in to clean my room. The maid comes in, looks on, let's say the table that I have that uh, bag of white powder, sees it, she suspects that it's cocaine and what does she do? She calls the police. Police come in, they wait for me and then they arrest me. Can they do this? The answer to that question is going to be yes. Because how did she find the cocaine? Well, technically, she found it in plain view. She wasn't looking for anything. She was employed in the scope and duties of her employment, basically cleaning the room. Now, if we change this scenario a little bit, it gets interesting. Let's say police follow a really valid, credible tip that I have cocaine in this hotel room. Police know that I have cocaine in this room, but they don't have time to get the search warrant. So what they do is they wait for me to leave my room and they see that I put maid service. They wait for the maid to come. And then they say, listen, do us a favor. While you're cleaning that room, take a look around, tell us if you see anything. She opens up the door, she starts doing what she's paid to do in the scope and duties of her employment and sees again on that table that magic white powder known as cocaine. She alerts the police, say, it's right there. Police wait for me to come and then they arrest me. Would this be a valid arrest? Well, the courts are going to say no. And here's the reason. How did this scenario work? Well, the way this scenario worked was Police were at the hotel room. And what did they do? They asked the maid to look around and see if she, quote unquote, saw anything. Well, now, if they're asking her to look for things to see, what exactly are they looking for? A reasonable person would probably think they're looking for some sort of fruits of the crime, some sort of contraband. In this case, we're talking about drugs. Well, the issue now here is, what have they actually done with the maid? Well, if they're asking the maid to do their duties, to do law enforcement duties, they've sort of technically deputized her. And if they've deputized her, she's acting under the auspices of law enforcement. Now, if that is the case, well, the Fourth Amendment now applies to her. Was this a reasonable search of the room? And the courts are gonna say no, because what did the police ask her to do? They asked her to act out of the scope of her duties and employment, to not act as a maid to clean up the room, but to act in a law enforcement capacity to see what they could see. So again, in that second scenario, if I were to get arrested and that be charged with the cocaine, that uh, evidence would be deemed inadmissible. It would be excluded. That is a fruit of the poisonous tree. Now we're at the E, 
the E is going to be the emergency exception, sometimes called exigent circumstances. Really what this has to do with is that the reason why police are searching some place is not looking for contraband, but to cure an emergency. Usually when we talk about emergency exceptions, usually what we're talking about is a person in grave danger. Usually uh, the person, there is this chance that they're going to be caused serious physical injury and or death. A lot of times what we talk about are like kidnapping and or bomb threat type of scenarios. So if a poli police officer gets some sort of radio call that there is a bomb threat in an apartment, the police officer can break the door down and look for the bomb. The reason being is that they're not looking for contraband. They're not looking for drugs. They're not looking for weapons. What they're looking to do is to find the bomb to quote unquote, cure the emergency. I don't want to talk any more about protocols. For some of you, some of you might have some training that where there's one bomb, there might be another. Regardless, for purposes of this lecture, the reason why police broke down that door was not to seize evidence, but to cure an emergency. So now we're on to the ship part of spaceship. So that first, that's, excuse me, that second S is going to be stop, question, and frisk. If you recall the last lecture, I called them Terry stops because they're based upon the case Terry versus Ohio. These stops can only be conducted where a police officer has reasonable suspicion. Where And what is reasonable suspicion as we defined it in the last class, where a reasonable person would suspect a crime has been, is being, or is about to be committed. Furthermore, at least in New York State, some other jurisdictions might not do it this way. But in New York State, police officers are only allowed to frisk a person if they reasonably suspect that that person is armed and dangerous. So police officers in New York State cannot legally frisk for drugs, fruits of the crime, any sort of contraband other than a person being armed and dangerous. Now, the reason why this is part of spaceship is let's say a police officer has reasonable suspicion that a person is armed and dangerous. Let's say that they have a firearm on them and they can articulate that they reasonably suspect that the person is not a duly licensed firearms owner in the state of New York. Police officer conducts a Terry stop. Terry stops are custodial stops, meaning that the person is not free to leave. So, Let's say the police officer stops that person because they notice something in their right front pants pocket that in their training and experience seems to look like a firearm. Maybe the butt of the firearm is sticking out of the shirt, something to that effect. Police officer forcibly stops that person. Again, when we're talking about forcibly, doesn't mean that we're putting hands on a person, just means that the person is not free to leave. Police officer, let's say, questions that person. Hey, what's in that right front pants pocket? Does the person have to answer? Well, the Fifth Amendment says no, that the person never has to act against their penal interest, that they never have to self-incriminate, that they have the right to remain silent. So the police officer conducts a frisk. Now, in a case like this, the police officer is going to conduct a general frisk of the area where they reasonably suspect that that person is armed and dangerous. In this case, let's say the right front pants pocket. So we're doing basically the thigh of that person. Police officer is frisking, doing a pat down, feeling just on the outermost garment. Police officer feels something that in his or her training and experience feels to be a firearm. Police officer asks, what is that in your pocket? Let's say the person again refuses to answer which they're allowed to do. The police officer now can escalate this frisk, this pat down of the outermost garment, pick up the shirt and take the firearm out. That frisk has now escalated to a search and this would, consi this would consi be considered to be constitutionally protected, meaning this would be a valid search which means that if this firearm was recovered and the person is not a duly licensed firearms owner in the state of New York, 
this would be admitted into evidence. It would not be excluded as evidence. So fruits of the poisonous tree or the exclusionary rule would not be applicable here. Hot pursuit, really what I want you to know is that you're running after someone. Usually when we talk about hot pursuits, we're talking about person to person chases. When we're talking about this concept of close pursuits, usually we're talking about vehicle pursuits. Honestly, you can make that dis distinction if you like. For me, it does not matter. A pursuit is a pursuit. I'm looking for someone. Now, let's say I'm a police officer and I see someone running down the street with a firearm in their hand. The reasonable person would probably think that this person should not have this firearm. So now let's say I start running after this person. The person runs into an apartment and locks the door. As soon as he locks the door, we hear people in that apartment screaming, oh my God, he's got a gun. He's going to shoot me. He's going to hurt me. Well, since the police officer was in hot pursuit and never lost sight of the person, or maybe just momentarily lost sight. And when I mean momentarily, we're talking like a few seconds. We're not talking blocks of like 15 or 20 minutes. The police officer could actually break the door down to get to that person. He, would, he or she, the police officer, was in pursuit. And then really, if you sort of think about it, what's going on inside that apartment? Well, you hear people screaming, oh my God, he's got a gun. He's going to kill me. He's going to shoot me. Well, now sort of the emergency exception or exigent circumstances kick in as well. Nothing operates in a vacuum. So this is why the police officer can break down the door to cure this emergency and effect an arrest. Last but not least, we're going to talk about the inventory procedure. Um, now, at least in New York State, there is some really weird peculiarities when we're talking about this. And your case brief, uh, the Jimenez case, really talks about when police can search incidental to a lawful arrest and or when police can inventory search. So there's a hint for all of you that haven't done it yet, and it's due in a few days. Let's say in order for police to search portable containers not on the person, things not like a wallet, things not like a cigarette case. So we're talking about, let's say, nap cap, nap, knapsacks, briefcases. They have to show a nexus between the offense being committed and something in that knapsack that would contribute to the offense being committed. Now, in New York State, it's very weird. Now, this is not ever going to be a testable concept in my class, but I just wanted you to hear this, that in order for police to search a knapsack, incidental to a lawful arrest, they must have a reasonable belief that one of the three E's, those endangerment, escape, or evidence, which is connected to the offense, to the person that's about to be arrested, they have to establish this nexus and they have to have a reasonable belief. Now, this is the very first and the very last time you're ever gonna hear me use this term, reasonable belief. Really easy way to think about reasonable belief is let's go back to People versus DeBoer in chapter four. Level three were Terry stops based on reasonable suspicion. Level four were arrests based on probable cause. This idea of reasonable belief is a 3.5. So it's a little bit more than reasonable suspicion, a little bit less than probable cause. That's really all I want to talk about as far as this concept of reasonable belief, it's not going to be a testable concept in my class, but I wanted you to hear it. So let's say a police officer arrests someone and they cannot legally search that knapsack incidental to a lawful arrest. Well, they're not going to throw someone's personal property out. How about this? We'll use an example. Let's say a person gets arrested for criminal possession of marijuana. So they're smoking a marijuana cigarette in public view. So it is burning, it is in public view. 
The procedures of the NYPD notwithstanding in the New York State Penal Law, this is still considered to be a misdemeanor. So let's say the police officer arrests the person. Let's say the person has a knapsack. Now, you could try and maybe push the boundaries and articulate, well, if the person was smoking marijuana, they might have had more marijuana in the knapsack, which is why I searched it sort of sounds flatty and it sort of sounds like something that district attorneys would probably not entertain so anything found in that knapsack would probably again be inadmissible and or excluded if this ever went to trial so let's say the person has a knapsack it's this person's personal property so we agree that we're not going to throw it out so we don't throw it out so we bring it back to the precinct so we're now in that arrest processing stage. So the police officer is doing paperwork. They fingerprint the person. Well, now what do we do with the knapsack? Can they bring that knapsack to central booking to await for arraignment? Well, no, you can't do that because what if there was a weapon? So what do we do? Well, we're actually going to technically voucher or inventory this person's personal property because when they get out of jail, the expectation is they're going to want their property back. So we inventory it. Now, during this inventory procedure, it's administrative. We're holding it for safekeeping. So the police officer is going to inventory the knapsack itself and the contents contained within. So let's say the police officer doing this inventory procedure opens up the knapsack and finds a defaced firearm, well, can they charge for the firearm? Well, the courts are going to say yes, that due to the inventory procedure, the police officer wasn't looking for contraband, was not looking for weapons or any sort of fruits of the crime. What they were doing is they were inventorying the backpack and the contents contained within for the prisoner's personal property, for safekeeping, so that when the, when the person gets out, usually probably during arraignment, they can take that their contents back. So they weren't looking for contraband, but they found it. So this is an example of the inventory procedure. That last page just stands for period. It just makes spaceship work. So we have spaceship. First S, search incidental to lawful arrest. The P, plain view. A, the automobile exception probable cause against the vehicle only. That's all I want you to know. C, consent. E, the emergency exception. S, stop, question, and frisk, otherwise known as Terry stops. H, hot pursuits. I, the inventory procedure. So that is spaceship. Lastly, in this lecture, I just want to quickly talk about warrants in New York State, particularly. What is a warrant? A warrant is a court order. Usually when we talk about warrants, we're talking about two different types of warrants. We're either going to talk about arrest warrants or we're gonna talk about search warrants. A really easy way to think about this is that arrest warrants refer to people, search warrants refer to places. A search warrant refers to a place, even if that place is on a person, for example, a cavity search. In order for a police officer to conduct a cavity search, they would need to procure a search warrant. They would need to show probable cause as to why they are searching this place. So for arrest warrants, really easy. They refer to people. Now, if you read in the book or if you read in the PowerPoint, there's actually arrest warrants and bench warrants. They are both technically arrest warrants. Really easy way to think about them. Arrest warrants are issued before arraignment, before the Sixth Amendment right to know the charges being leveled against you. A bench warrant means that that person has been arraigned, so they know the charges being leveled against them. However, they did not go to, a, to some sort of future court date. So that's when a bench warrant would be issued. So arrest warrants, before arraignment, bench warrants issued by the judge, issued by the bench after arraignment. What I want you to know about arrest warrants is that they can be executed at any time, any day. They can be executed by any police officer. 
let's say I issue a summons for urinating in public. I tell that person that they need to go to New York City Criminal Court to answer this out. They don't go. So they don't go to their uh, uh, judgment date. Therefore, what happens is the court issues an arrest warrant because they haven't been arraigned. So they issue an arrest warrant. Let's say three months later, another police officer stops the person for, let's say, the same thing. Doesn't even matter. What is that police officer going to do? Well, they're going to say, listen, you're in violation of the health code. I need your ID. So they take the ID. Then they run the name through their radio. What's going to happen is that a warrant is going to pop up, meaning that the person had a court date that they did not answer. So now what is that police officer that was going to issue the second summons going to do? Well, they're actually going to arrest that person based on the warrant. Now, even though that second police officer didn't issue the warrant, they can arrest based on the fact that there is a warrant. Search warrants refer to places. Police officers must have a search warrant in order to search a residence unless it's one of those court-recognized exceptions, something like, let's say, hot pursuit or an emergency exception. With search warrants in New York State, there are some numbers that I want you to remember. The first number is when can a search warrant be executed? Well, from the day that a police officer applies and gets a search warrant, he or she has 10 calendar days with which to affect that search warrant. And notice I say calendar days. It's not 10 working days for that police officer because police officers by law work five days on and either two days off five and two or five, two and five and three, at least in the NYPD they do. So it's 10 calendar days, whether or not that officer is working, whether he or she is on vacation, he or she is out sick, does not matter. They have 10 calendar days with which to affect that warrant. Secondly, unless there is some sort of nighttime endorsement and a police officer would have to articulate why he or she is requesting that nighttime endorsement. In New York State, search warrants can only be affected from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or in military time, which I prefer teaching, they can only be affected from 0900, uh, 0600, excuse me, 0600 by 2100 hours. For my students, I'm going to tell you, I have a question on my final asking this exact question, and I'm gonna mess with the numbers. If you understand military time and you remember 0600 by 2100 hours, you're never ever gonna get that question wrong. So I'm gonna ask you to remember it that way. Now, some peculiarities with search warrants. Let's say I have an arrest warrant for a person. I can go to that person's house. They open up the door. I can arrest them and I can search their residence based on that arrest warrant. Here's where things get interesting. Let's say I have an arrest warrant for a person and I, I've received reliable, credible information that that person is at someone else's house. Let's say a quote unquote significant other. So I knock on the door of that significant other and I ask, can I search that house? Unless they give me consent to search, although I have an arrest warrant for a person that I know is in that apartment, I cannot search the third party's residence without procuring a search warrant. Uh, one last thing with search warrants. Again, I just wanna talk about those knapsacks and briefcases. Like I said before, if a knapsack or a briefcase is unlocked, I can search it. If a knapsack or briefcase is locked and a key is available, I can search it. However, if a knapsack or a briefcase is locked and no key is readily available, meaning that the person who owns that, where there might be contraband or whatever, does not have access to, the, to that, then time is not of the essence. And if time is not of the essence, then there, the courts have reason that there is enough time to procure a search warrant. 
I think that is about it for this chapter. One last thing that I just sort of want to talk about, cell phones. Let's say I'm a police officer. I'm arresting a person for robbery. It doesn't even really matter. I have probable cause to effect an arrest. So I tell the person, turn around, face the wall, place your hands behind your back. Search incidental to lawful arrest. I can search that person head to toe. Let's say in their left rear pants pocket, I pull out a cell phone. And the cell phone is the person's property, the person that I'm arresting. This is his or her cell phone. Well, I can, I can take that cell phone and I can put it into evidence. However, without a search warrant, although I've taken the cell phone incidental to a lawful arrest, in order for me to look inside that phone for pictures, texts, uh, videos, contacts, emails, anything like that, I would need to procure a search warrant because I would need to articulate a reason why I was looking into that cell phone. What is my reason for looking into that cell phone other than just curiosity? Is there some sort of nexus between the search of this cell phone and the offense for which that person is being arrested for? If I can't establish that nexus, I am not going to get a search warrant. Therefore, there's no reason for me to search the contents of that cell phone. This lecture is concluded. In a few days on Blackboard, I'm going to deploy, again, a 10-question quiz on this chapter. Good luck, and I will see you all soon.